Well, hello everyone. This is Ranger Rob and welcome to the Ranger Rob Country Living Channel. And yes, I have not done a live stream before for for the Ranger Rob Country Living. Done lots of live streams before, but not for <laughs> not for just chatting. So I'm going to use this uh, particular chat for also our podcast. So before I go any farther, we do have a podcast and it's featured on Spreaker and uh uh, we try to do a podcast once a week. Not haven't been great on the uh, schedule at all, but <laughs> I'm working on it. So uh, uh, those of you that are watching, if you get a chance, can you let me know if the sound's okay? Uh, everything seems all right on this side. And uh, I'm going to kind of go through things on the channel, some subjects. And if uh, since this is a new chat and people aren't used to us coming online, if we get any questions or anything about our homesteading, uh, or, or prepping, or gardening, or hydroponics, uh, we will address those. So those that are here, uh, I want to welcome you to the channel. I hope you uh, uh, enjoy our time together. Um, I'm not planning on going over an hour, and this show will also be featured on the Ranger Rob podcast on Spreaker. And all that information, by the way, will be uh, in the description below. So... <laughs> Here we are. I also have the chicken cam off to the side if anybody needs to see the chicken cam and get a chicken fix. So uh, first of all, uh, I'm Rob Scribner, which uh, my nickname is Ranger Rob. And this is the Ranger Rob Country Living Channel. And we talk about uh, homesteading. And we have a five-acre homestead in Central Oregon. And we'll talk about and answer any questions about that. And also... Uh, uh, we talk about prepping and self-reliance, which to me, I think is really important in this day and age. And uh, also uh, we talk about uh, hydroponics, gardening, and a lot of other common sense things that don't seem to be common sense anymore. So uh, we do daily videos on YouTube under Ranger Rob Country Living. And uh, uh our channel's been growing pretty consistently. Uh, we're not a giant channel or anything like that. And uh, we uh, uh, so much appreciate all the other homestead and prepping channels out there. And uh, so uh, whenever we hear something uh, good from them, which they're always something good, uh, we also try to tell all of our listeners and viewers to uh, go visit those channels also. Because we've learned a lot from them. And uh, a lot of folks have said they've learned a lot from us too. Now the goal on... Ranger Rob Country Living is to show people, um, beginners, be, <coughs> excuse me, I'm drinking lemonade and it's kind of sour. So anyway, we, uh, we're not absolutely new, now I sneeze, um, absolutely new to homesteading. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> That's what I like about lives. You just, everything goes wrong. So uh, I don't think I've ever sneezed on a live show before. Hey, that's a first. So anyway, uh, we started our main homestead here a year ago. And so it had, you know, a house and a shop on it already. <laughs> Please don't sneeze anymore. And uh, so we've had to build onto it. So we built uh, a chicken coop. For uh, laying hens, we have Rhode Island Reds, and we also um, uh, built a greenhouse, built a garden area, and then discovered hydroponics, and we have four hydroponic types of systems on the property that we feature as often as we can on the homestead uh, regular vlog, and uh, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys have a question about hydroponics anything about how do we get started in homesteading. Um, the definition of homesteading is basically trying to be as self-reliant as possible. And so homesteading can look a lot different. You could have a homestead up in the boonies in Idaho and bears and cougars are running around your yard. Or you could be just outside of cities or rural areas 
um, you could still call yourself a homestead. So uh, you don't have to have tons of acreage and you don't have to have um, you know, giant trees and build log cabins and the whole works. Homesteading really just means being self-reliant. And so that's what uh, we've been uh, trying to achieve here on our homestead. And so uh, uh, we've been coming along pretty good. Um, we've done a lot in just uh, a one-year period. And it, it ranges from building buildings to making garden systems to hydroponics to uh, uh, doing electrical backup systems like uh, generators and stuff like that um, to be self-sufficient in case of emergency. So when we're talking about prepping or emergencies or getting off grid when you don't want to be off grid, um, we're not always talking about disasters. We're not talking about, um, you know, uh, World War, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I mean, it, it could happen, but there's so many other things. Obviously, we, we witnessed, and I actually monitored the power grid for the United States. Uh, you wouldn't want to be in um, Louisiana right now because you'd be sitting in the dark unless you're prepared. So we talk about getting prepared and being self-reliant. And one of the main things we want to talk, you know, always talk about is it could be a tornado or a hurricane, an earthquake, uh, a domestic issue, um, a power grid problem, and also something more intimate, you know, or uh, outside forces did something to us. And uh, so we want to just be prepared for those things and not live in fear. Uh, this is not a channel about being in fear. This is a channel about being proactive, um, accountable for yourself, self-reliant, and realize no matter how much we may all love our government and all this stuff, it's impossible for them to save us. <laughs> It'll save some of us, but no, we kind of witnessed that last week, didn't we? So uh, anyway, I do have a list of things I'll go through. If I get interrupted or anything comes across the chat, feel free to say hello. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, even uh, if you catch this after the show's over and you just see the recording, please, uh, in the uh, description, um, in the discussion area, comment area, please say hello. We'd really appreciate it. And let us know the things you're interested in. Let us know the things that you're doing. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, any kind of thing that we address on this show. If you have questions or want us to talk more about in other shows, let us know. We'd appreciate it. Uh, so let's go going. Uh, first of all, where do you find us? Well, we talked about our podcast. You can find us on Spreaker. Uh, the show is called Ranger Rob Country Living. And Ranger Rob is actually an old nickname I got from, uh, oh, sheesh, years ago. And uh, back in, oh, 2006 or seven, uh, I bought the domain. <laughs> so then later on, I created, uh, you'll see a lot in our shows and stuff. We always show you the Ranger Rob poopy bags. So it was a pet peeve of mine about, poopy bags um, when I was traveling a lot. And so I actually designed my own. And so we have three models of the Ranger Rob poopy bags. You can get them in rolls. And these are sheets. And you can get, a, get them in rolls with a dispenser, a fabric one. They're really nice. Anyway, but the name Ranger Rob, since we've created a project product, we also created, uh, got the trademark of Ranger Rob. So we just kind of branded everything Ranger Rob. And it kind of gives it all consistency. So that's where the nickname came. No, I'm not a ranger or anything like that. It's just Ranger Rob, a, a hunting and fishing nickname I got back in the 80s uh, from some crazy friends. <laughs> I bet you they never thought I'd take it this far. So anyway, uh, um, and and yes, we are, our show is um, supported by the Ranger Rob poopy bags, which are available on Amazon, by the way, and are very affordable. And you'll love them because they got handles and all that stuff. So anyway, so you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook. We have a Ranger Rob Country Living Facebook page. We're on Instagram under Ranger Rob Channel. And uh, and uh, I think that's all I can think. We do have Twitter. I have a Twitter account under Rob Scribner. And uh, uh, we've tied that into this thing. I don't really have a Ranger Rob, just Ranger Rob Twitter page and uh, because I just couldn't get the name. So uh, we just use my personal name. So uh, let's talk about homesteading first. So we're 
just two years ago, <laughs> uh, first of all, we used to, this is central Oregon that we're at. And so it's called, um, it's, it's a high desert area. And so some people will say, well, that's kind of a crazy place to homestead, but actually um, you can do a lot with in a high desert. It doesn't have to be the evergreen state part of everything. Um, anyway, uh, and if you watch our show and watch our daily vlogs, you'll see we've done amazing things with gardening and hydroponics. So anyway, we used to live here before, and I actually used actually used to raise game birds. And this is before I really even discovered what homesteading was. I was kind of doing it without realizing it. And uh, they didn't really talk about propping much. And this was uh, the late 90s. And uh, anyway, so eventually we left the area and life went on. And, and uh, you'll also look, if you're in the channel, you'll see that we're in Arizona thinking that that's where we're going to end up because <laughs> I retired from an aerospace company. Oh, it works. Well, Sherry's folks live here, um, lived here, and her father passed away two years ago, and we came to caregivers of her mother, and her mother can maintain the area and all that stuff. And we brought her down to Arizona for a while. But uh, we wanted, well, one is we had this house up here empty, a beautiful home, and uh, we uh, finally made the decision that we'll buy the parents' home and we'll bring Sherry's mother back up the bend where she still has some friends and she's in assisted living. So uh, we take care of her and uh, uh, she does have a lot of medical needs and, and problems like that. And uh, so it's really neat because she was really into gardening and stuff. And so this property was kind of set up for gardening. Um, not so much food gardening, just flowers and things like that. And um, uh, they just weren't into that stuff. But uh, the systems were in place for us to build onto it. So when we bought the house and brought her mother up here, uh, she really enjoys occasionally uh, coming over and seeing what we've done with the property, which just, you know, she's 84 now and she, uh, uh, has a hard time getting around. She's on oxygen, the whole works. But uh, anytime we bring her here, we always take her to the back, uh, drive the car right up to the greenhouse. She loves to see the hydroponic um, uh, tomatoes and things like that. And she just, she just lights up. And she's a she was a master gardener in her time. So she's like a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> it's kind of funny. She got kind of a short term memory, but anything in the past, she's like a, uh, a, a library when it comes to plants and, and soil and stuff. So she, uh, her feedback and her ideas and what she knows about this property uh, is very uh, nice to have. And so she enjoys the fact that the property is still being utilized as growing and it's still being kept the same and uh, as far as what she remembers. And it's a great relationship. Uh, however, we've had to put a lot of money into this place to get it back up to snuff. And because uh, their last five years were pretty tough, they're real frail and the whole works. So we put a new roof, new siding on this house. All those videos uh, on Ranger Rob Country Living have shown how we did all that. And there was no infrastructure at all for growing food here. And the other problem there is when, when you live in high desert is if you've been in any high desert area, you'll realize that the soil is not the best. Uh, it has to be amended a lot, things like that. <laughs> so as we say, all right, we're going to put our gardens here for you know, food gardens. And uh, But the very first thing we did on this property was bring in chickens. And so uh, you'll see the process of us bringing in our Rhode Island Reds, building our own pen, building a house for the chickens that were, it was kind of unique. So we, uh, uh, when the uh, chickens did lay their eggs, they were very clean and whole works. And so uh, anyway, that was mission one. And then uh, later we was like, you know, I think we're going to need a, because of the, the weather and the climate here, I think we're going to want a greenhouse. But we didn't want to buy a kit and all that stuff. We actually built one from scratch. And we did a lot, watched a lot of YouTube channels, kind of figure out what kind of design we wanted. And we'd literally built it. And so uh, luckily it was before lumber prices went nuts. <laughs> so anyway, um, and, and, and they really, I mean, we really got our lumber at a decent price back then, but that same lumber would have probably been 
almost maybe 60% more if we would have built it this year. So that worked out really good. And we didn't know anything about greenhouses. <laughs> so we were starting from scratch, you know, it was like, how should we design it? What kind of plastic do we put on it? How do we uh, do the ventilation? How do we keep it warm? How do we keep it cool? We had to learn all that. And that's what our channel is all about is if you're new and, and a lot of people are getting concerned about things nowadays, uh, they're thinking about homesteading or being a little bit more self-reliant and they want to get out to the country a little bit. Um, that's what our channel is. We are people are doing that. So uh, and so we're not just talk. We walk the talk and we talk the walk, <laughs> both of it. And uh, uh, we're kind of proud of that. And so uh, uh, I'm assuming my comment thing, if you guys have any comments or any questions, please interrupt me. I'll be happy to uh, stop and, and uh, otherwise I'll just go through the line here because I'm kind of treating this like a podcast. So uh, anyway, so when we got halfway through building the gardens and stuff and, and starting to amend the uh, gardens in the, in, the, in the soil and brought trucks in of uh, compost and things like that, we realized we were spending a lot of money just to try to get the soil up the snuff. And uh, yes, we did build a compost bin and stuff like that, and we do create our own compost. Uh, anyway, uh, while we're doing that, I stumbled onto this one uh, YouTube channel. It was like MG Gardener. And this guy was into hydroponic tomatoes. I think I was doing research on tomatoes. And I saw him doing this thing called Dutch Bucket Systems. And I thought that was probably the coolest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. And it doesn't require soil. <laughs> and I'm going, hey, I don't have to buy all these truckloads of stuff, all that. So uh, that was the other incentive to build a greenhouse. And it's like once we had a greenhouse, we could actually do this but, uh, <laughs> Dutch bucket system that they were showing us. So we thought that was pretty cool. So once again, if you go back in our uh, history and our videos, you'll see how we built the greenhouse and how we built the uh, uh, Dutch buckets. And that was literally our first hydroponic system. Um, and the other thing that guy was doing is a thing called, uh, and I'm going to talk about four different hydroponics, uh, floating raft system. And so in the greenhouse, we decided to do the Dutch bucket system and the floating raft system all in the same area. And I got to tell you, both of them are amazing. Those are my two favorite. Now, the third hydroponics system we have is called NFT, which is nutrient film uh, technique. And uh, all that is is you take nutrients up a pipe and at about a 3% three, uh, 3 slope, take it to the front and let it drain back to the tank and it recycles. And uh, <coughs> it's an amazing system. Um, the problem we have with our NFT is our NFT is outdoors. And so when we got hit with the 100 degree weathers and stuff like that, and the fact that I use black pipe, uh, the a ABS stuff, uh, I couldn't get the white PVC. Anyway, it got too warm. Now, we've kind of solved that problem of when you watch our videos. Uh, we put a, ca a canvas over the top of it. And so uh, and it's starting to cool off here a little bit. So we'll definitely be nailing, uh, nailing everything with uh, <clears throat> uh, lettuce and things like that for the fall. And, uh, and the other thing we're learning about this climate, which obviously was different than the climate in Arizona, uh, we had to learn how this climate worked and when the freezes were and when the last freeze was going to be. So we had to learn all that stuff, too. And we're still having mastered everything. So anyway, um, so the third hydroponic system that went in was the NFT. Mm, lemonade. And uh, I should have added something to that. So once we, <laughs> there's a lot of things I could add to that. So a uh, uh, little gin I hear works really good in lemonade. Anyway, I squirreled on you there for a second. So once we got the NFT systems, we put two different NFT systems, a one that ro rode really low and we put a trellis on it so we could grow things like beans and peas on it. And, uh, and when you watch our videos, you'll see the, the pros and cons of all the systems we used. And then, uh, uh, later on, uh, around the same time, not that far off, I also saw another type of hydroponics that just blew my mind. And that was using towers, um, growing towers. 
And so I, I kind of looked around for a while to find out what were out there. And we ended up just going with uh, what they call Mr. Stackies, which, uh, hey, Carrie, uh, Mr. Stackies you can get on Amazon. And so we decided to do five towers and we're going to just do strawberries. So we call them the strawberry towers. And they also are hydroponic, but they're not a return system. So we have a tank of nutrients that uh, go into the tower at the top and uh, feed the plants. Uh, because once you put water in the top, it feeds the one next down below that. And uh, uh, it regenerates. It's, uh, it just continues to water everything below uh, to each stack on the on the tower. And the difference with that is when all the nutrients get through the tower, and then at the very bottom we have a little, um, um, what do you call it, kind of a bucket, and we actually will grow things down there too. When it catches the drips that come out of the tower, out of the towers, but all in all, the nutrients go into the ground. And no, it doesn't hurt the environment or anything like that. It's all good stuff. Yeah, it makes the green, the, uh, the weeds grow around them really well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So anyway, um, I got to make an adjustment on my uh, green screen because I see I've got kind of a funny thing going on here. So let me fix that a little bit. And that should do it. All right. Yep, that did it. So, uh, no, I'm not sitting in a log cabin. I'm literally at our house and in my studio at a green screen. Uh, so anyway, so those are the four systems. We have the uh, strawberry towers with the non-return system, NFT hydroponics, uh, which does return, uh, the Dutch bucket system, which returns, does a return to the fluids that you put into the plants, go back into a pipe and return to the tank. And then last but not least, we have what's called the floating rafts. If I was going to tell you what my two favorites are, it'd definitely be the Dutch buckets and the floating rafts. Super simple. And a lot of the stuff you could do in your house. So if you live in an apartment or a townhouse or a condo and you want to do hydroponics, there should be nothing that stops you from doing that. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is on our channel, we put emphasis on homesteading, self-reliance. We've uh, done this even before we got here. We were into prepping. Why? Uh, just watch the news. Why, why wouldn't you prep? Um, and prepping doesn't mean disaster. We're not looking for an apocalypse here. Um, but boy, you know, you watch all these disasters. If you're in, if you're in uh, Louisiana right now, would you be happy that you prepped a little bit? Uh, I, I think the answer, we all know that answer. So uh, anyway, uh, so we started our prep, prepping quite a while ago. So um, we think that we're prepped up for at least over a year of food now. And and we do, uh, now we have a homestead, we're preserving a lot of our own food that we're growing. And it's really cool because we also have what's called one of those freeze dryers from, a, uh, I'll think of the name of that company eventually. Anyway, uh, our freeze dryer, we freeze a lot of our beans and a lot of our tomato stuff. We just made tomato powder to cook with. Uh, we do, you know, we'll get like pineapples and we'll freeze dry those and then we'll uh, store them away and they're good for 25 years. So we've been actually, we've increased our prepping on the homestead because we've grown so much food and we refuse to waste food. And so when we have food here, we either uh, save the food uh, or preserve it. Uh, or if something gets um, where we can't harvest all the lettuce and stuff like that, it goes to the chickens. And if we can't give, give it to the chickens or we have something that we grew that we don't think the chickens should eat, um, we'll put it in our compost. And nothing goes to waste here. Uh, it's kind of a mini permaculture system that we're trying to develop here. And uh, our future, by the way, is we're going to do, we want to do more in the meat, but we'll talk about meat in a little bit. We're kind of going to stick with gardening and hydroponics. But later in this discussion, we'll talk about that more. Um, also, um, uh, our channel, we talk about gardening. We do do conventional gardening too. And so, uh, uh, we we're quite successful with Walla Walla onions and, uh, uh, some other plants, uh, typical zucchinis and stuff like that. We made a killing. Um, but 
nothing has beaten <laughs> our hydroponics, but uh, we did amend our soil enough to be able to do some gardening conventionally. And so uh, uh, once again, when you go to our channel, and watch our videos, you'll see all the different kinds of gardens we have. And, uh, uh, and, and by the way, we do have a pond and we also do flowers and things like that. And Sherry's learning how to make flower baskets and stuff. So uh, we're not always just doing food. So uh, I'm pretty much doing all the food. Sherry says, I like flowers too. <laughs> so she, it's like, okay, let's do flowers. Uh, so anyway, so we do a lot of gardening here. And the fun part about our channel is it's a channel where we're learning. We're not trying to be the experts. We're kind of talking to you what we uh, what we uh, have discovered. Uh, Carrie, by the way, says, uh, do you have rain collectors? I was thinking about that the other day. Let me see where you go. I just put it on screen. And, and you said you were on a well. Yes. Uh, if you lost electricity, how do, uh, would you lose water? Great question. I was actually going to get to that later. So let's talk. Let's stop for a second. Carrie, thank you very much. So uh, one of the things we want to do with this homestead is get it self-reliant in case of emergencies. So we have our own well. And a well is electric. So it comes off the uh, power off the house. So if we lost our electric, whatever water is in the, what they call a pressure tank, which is a 50 gallon tank, once that water has gone, it's not pumping water into that anymore. I'd be out of water. So last year, and we have a video of it, we had an electrician come in and do a bypass in the well house where we can take a, we have a, uh, I just bought a champion um, 5,000 watt uh, generator last year. And, uh, which takes over 30 amps, which is more than enough power to run our well. And I had an adapter put on in the outside of the well that plugs directly into our generator. So uh, I don't have to run that generator 24 seven to keep water in this house um, because I've got that 50 gallon tank in there. So if we're just doing dishes and washing and cooking, I can run the generator for a very short period of time, fill up that tank, and I'd have 50 gallons of water uh, throughout the house until that was gone. But the other thing is we have a very large property with grass and things like that. And some of uh, some of our vegetables are reliant on a watering system we have built into the house. And so I could actually run our watering system that's built in, in, in this property um, as long as I have that generator on. So... Basically, as long as I have a generator, I have unlimited water. So that's kind of, I hope that answers your question. Um, and uh, we still have stored water, bottled water and things like that too. In case some reason it was, there was something extreme like an EMP or something came along, I couldn't use my generator or I ran out of fuel or something like that. Uh, I can assure you we store about almost 70 gallons of fuel every winter and uh uh you're welcome um uh, and by the way all the gas that we store we also put the preservative into it so our gas is in good shape all winter long then when summer comes we try to burn up all that gas with our lawnmower if you've seen our videos we have large lawns here <laughs> and uh, it takes three and a half hours to mow all of our lawns here um, and so Sherry kind of burns through all of our fuel so we don't have old fuel around. And now that fall's coming, we're starting to go in and fill all of those tanks. Um, so the bad part is there's a window during the summer where I'm actually lower on fuel than I should be. Uh, I could fix that by getting a few more tanks, but uh, we're actually starting to take five gallon containers into the gas station and filling up four or five of them each time. And, and by the way, if you haven't noticed the price of gas, that kind of stings, but uh, we are uh, half of our fuel is already replaced. And once I have them all in, then we go in and add the additives and stuff like that. Where are you from Carrie, by the way, um, if you get a chance, let me know where you're from. Uh, so anyway, so thank you for that question. Great question. Um, and that's what homesteading is all about. Are you self-sufficient? Um, and, and it doesn't mean you have to be 100%. I mean, it's nothing. Um, uh, I know you'll watch some of these homestead channels and they kind of make you like 
why aren't you out in the country? Why aren't you in a log cabin with a wood stove, you know, and all that stuff? Hey, <laughs> just do what you can. Um, you know, a lot of things will dictate it, where you live, what your income is, uh, what you're allowed, uh, able to do. Um, if you can't grow your own food, well, then go to Costco more and buy bulk food and maybe get a freeze dryer and start a um, Clearwater, Florida. Wow. Um, I think I'd like Florida. Uh, anyway, but I'd have to buy a cruise boat, and I don't want—I don't want any more boats in my life. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, anyway, so uh, we want to make sure the message to you is homesteading is practical. Uh, you do it at your speed, at your level, at your income, at your skill level, your age—all those things affect it. So uh, please don't. Hey. Uh, Blue Collar Pepper, welcome. Uh, yes, this is the first live show I've done for R Ranger Rob Country Living, so I'm stumbling a little bit. This is also going to be used for our podcast. So um, uh, so we're planning to run an hour, and I can't believe how long I've yacked already. But uh, welcome. If you have any questions or anything you want me to go back on, let me know. I'm kind of going down a list, but uh, we just got done talking about the electrical systems we put in. Um, but anyway, the big point is I want to make sure that we're not a channel that's here to belittle anybody. Uh, you know, do what you can. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Carrie. Um, and uh, Carrie, by the way, along the way, anytime you have questions or ideas or things you want to do, you can do a lot of things that we're doing here on a homestead in an apartment, in a townhouse, in a small rental without getting your rent, rent, rent your landlord mad at you and that stuff. There's things you can do now if you're planning to maybe homestead um, and change your, you know, if you're trying to homestead right where you're at in a townhouse, do it. You can still do a lot of things that we're doing. Maybe not 100%, but that's okay. <laughs> so please don't think we're a channel where you say, hey, you got to be a redneck or not. Um, so uh, anyway, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Whoosh. Anyway, so the next thing I want to do go into, we went to the four types of, uh, um, yeah, um, I would actually went kind of through my hydroponic systems earlier, but if you have any questions about, we have four types of hydroponics. Um, Blue Collar Prepper said he, he, he likes the uh, hydroponics. And if he has any questions about any of the systems we use, and, uh, and a lot of them can be used in your house, in your garage, in your back room, closet, whatever you want to do. And uh, you don't have to do it at the size that we're doing it. Um, I just went overboard, <laughs> tell you the truth. And uh, uh, there's also a system we don't do. It's called a cranky system where you can just have stagnant water without aerators in it or anything or pumps <coughs> and just grow at least some lettuce and some simple um, green green plants. Um with very little maintenance. I mean, if you're working every day and don't, and you're a busy person and you don't have time to take care of a garden, get a cranky system and you just pretty much get a seed started and the darn thing goes nuts. Uh, you, you know, the water or reservoir will have nutrients in it, but <laughs> and it drops and it, it and it's okay to let it drop. You don't have to refill it unless it drinks all the water. But uh, uh, the cranky system is actually a great way to do stuff in an apartment. Uh, but you'll probably need a grow light. So, uh, hey, if you're in a marijuana, you probably already have a grow light, right? <laughs> I'm not in a marijuana. <laughs> so anyway, every time I talk about grow lights, people say, oh, I know what those are for. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk to you is our pets. Is uh, In our videos, a lot of people uh, have noticed we have two dogs. We have a chocolate lab, and we also have a German Shepherd. Uh, I got to check this note out really quick here. And uh, I've watched some of your videos and done some of the smaller scale uh, laugh out loud, but excellent results. Cool. Excellent. You'll have to share with me or if you do videos or pictures, please send them. I love to see what you're doing. Uh, anyway, so I was going back to the pets. If you want to know a little bit, uh, we have a new German Shepherd. She's only a year and a half old now. Um, I'm so glad we moved here for her because I don't think she would have done well in sent in uh, Arizona, we had a regular lot with a swimming pool and that dog hates water. 
And so the, the chocolate lab loved it. So she got lots of exercise playing in the pool all the time. But I'm really glad I have this five acres that is fenced and protects my dogs. And uh, the German Shepherd is flourishing here. And there's a lot of things I didn't know about German Shepherds. I kind of knew, but it surprised me a little bit. Um, and so one is I did not know a German Shepherd is actually a herding dog. And that's where Cinder, the older dog, says, why did you get this stupid dog? Because it keeps biting her back legs to try to move her along. Anyway, it's a natural thing that German Shepherds did, and I didn't know that. And the other thing is a big surprise with German Shepherds is when they blow out their fur, they really blow out their fur. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> I mean, and it's like, it's like an explosion, like, and, and, and so it's kind of funny. Um, but we love the German Shepherd, but I'm so glad she has property because she needs it. And I've never seen a dog that can run so darn fast. Oh my gosh, that dog can, she is quick. And uh, uh, no way does a chocolate lab even come close to keeping up with her. But the chocolate lab, by the way, her name's Cinder. She's also the dog on the Ranger Rob poopy bags. That's kind of our version of <laughs> Cinder. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so she's kind of our famous dog. And she, but she's uh, about nine years old now. And uh, she's doing great. She loves this property. Uh, actually, as soon as she got here, she lost weight, probably because of you know, playing with the puppy. And and it's really surprising how well those two get along, even though uh, that German Shepherd can be quite irritating to her. So uh, anyway, uh, so Cinder's about nine. She's a, they're both purebreds. Uh, we love chocolate labs. And uh, we've always, I've always throughout my whole life, always wanted to get a, a German Shepherd. And uh, so I'm so glad we got her in Arizona, but I'm really glad I'm raising her here because she, that dog needs property. She needs to run, play, bark. Um, and it's funny is people think German Shepherds are mean, but actually it's, it's they're more intimidating. So when Belle, she's a female, so she's quite not as aggressive as say a male would be. But when she barks at somebody at a fence and stuff, you want to step back a little bit. That sound of that bark is like, dear Lord, I'm going to die. <laughs> and, uh, um, but it's all bark anyway. But, uh, I hate to see what happens if she actually got upset, but, uh, uh, but she's the gentlest dog I've ever, ever had. So, uh, she's turning out to be a really good dog. And, uh, so that's the kind of story behind the two dogs. And one of the reasons people ask is, are you going to free range your chickens? Unfortunately, because of her, we can't let the chickens run free in the yard. Um, and we do have predators here. So uh, uh, our chickens cannot free range in the property. However, I did order a chicken tractor for those that, uh, if you don't know what a chicken tractor is, it's a cage that has wheels on it that you can move through the property. And I have a grass section in the back of our property that I love to have the chickens churn up and poop in and do their thing. And you keep moving the chicken tractor every two to three days, letting the chickens um, really go after that. And by the time they're done, the grass is pretty much almost dead. But as you keep moving the chicken tractor, it comes back to life and then, and and it just um, uh, re-energizes the property and uh, uh, the field, the grass, the whole works. And it's an amazing thing. It's part of permaculture. And it'll be our mini version of doing that with our chickens. And where we're going to get the chickens will be our laying hens that we have now. Uh, they'll be into their second year, and eventually they're going to start slowing down. Well, our laying hens are kind of pets, <laughs> and I'm not really interested in butchering them. I would if I might. Um, I, I'm not against that. But I actually would like to put them to work in the fields and let them work our property and uh, and then eventually bring in a whole new set of laying hens to replace them and let them just live a really good life um, being able to eat bugs and grass and doing permaculture for us. So uh, uh, that's the scoop there. And what do I got for time here? So we got 20 minutes left. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about was, was our chickens is uh, we, we, always love brown eggs. And so I've always liked Rhode Island Reds and I do like a large egg. And uh, 
to tell you different, or just to tell you, if you know anything about freeze dryers, they have these little sheets things that when we load and we uh, we freeze dry 48 eggs a week. So when we do that, uh, you take uh, your eggs and you mix them up like you're going to scramble them raw and pour them into these sheets and you put them in the freeze dryer. And then over 24 to 30 hours, uh, you get pull them back out and they're like a little brick kind of thing. And you break them up and you turn them into powder, put them in mylar bags and uh, um, in a little uh, oxygen oxygenator or whatever they call those uh, into the bag, seal it. And it's good for 25 years. And you have, and the eggs taste like day one from now, 25 years from now. I may not even be around to be able to open those packages. But um, anyway, uh, the difference in a Rhode Island red egg size-wise is, for example, we watch a channel called uh, uh, Traditional Living Homestead. I think that's right. Living Traditions Homestead. And they do the same thing we do. But their eggs, they said... Oh, you can get 18 eggs into your sheets. Well, it's like as soon as we got our freeze dryer, the first thing we tried to do is put 18 eggs into our sheet. Doesn't work with <laughs> Rhode Island Reds. We can only get, uh, I think Sherry says she can only get a dozen into one sheet. That's the difference in the size of our eggs. And so uh, we can only do 48 eggs a load. We only can do four sheets. We have a medium size freeze dryer. So uh, anyway, it's amazing. Um, and so I've always liked Rhode Island Reds. And Rhode Island Reds are pretty tough little birds. They're good at winter. They have a good winter coat or a good feather system. And uh, we don't have to put heaters or anything out uh, in their house because uh, Rhode Island Reds uh, can, can handle pretty good cool weather. So uh, now there's other terrains that have worse weather than we do. But, uh, yeah, anyway, I got to get a sip here. And once again, I realize this is my first live show, so I'm not expecting a big audience. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do this on a weekly basis. And uh, we'll change the format as more people start showing up and then we get kind of a pattern going here. And um, But you got to start somewhere, and here we are. So anyway, uh, moving right along, I wanted to talk about self-reliance. So I may talk tap into a little bit of news here and stuff like that. But um, I've never seen in my lifetime, and guys, I'm 60 years old, so I'm an old geezer, right? Anyway, so um, I've seen a lot of stuff, but I sure in heck haven't seen all these problems with shortages, uh, problems with money, problems with our, our politics, our leaders. I mean, we've seen weird stuff with our leaders. I mean, I, I was around when Nixon had his issues and stuff. But nowadays, thanks, Kerry. Um, nowadays, I think what's really changed my lifetime is the money and power and greed is so strong now where it was, it existed back in early days too, but now it's even more. And it's not just one side of the aisle. So let's, let's make that clear. And so really the, the politicians are just playing a game, but it's all about money and greed. It's all about lobbyists and where they're getting their money to work. And they're just not making decisions or supporting the people. However, there is exceptions to that. There is, um, um, I'll, I'll say that for sure. And, but what we're seeing is in, insane. Uh, you know, the fiasco that happened overseas, you know, leaving people behind has never been acceptable. It wasn't acceptable years ago, and it sure it isn't acceptable now. But uh, you can kind of see that's a good example of a lot of times we could be on our own. Uh, the government, when it really comes down to it, the government is not worried about us. Um, they're worried about their own skin. So self-reliance is really what I, I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about the negative part of that stuff. I don't want to live in fear or anything. It's just don't let, if the power went out, just like, all right, Pull out the generators instead of freaking out. Um, the, the stores are empty or a lot of things you can't get. Uh, noodles or maybe some sauces or things you can't normally buy anymore. It's like, where is it? And paper and stuff. Those are the things like start stocking up. That's more in the prepping area. But that's being self-sufficient. It means you're not affected other than you're inconvenienced. But 
Um, and, it, and, it, and it's true with vegetables and food, and it's true with meat, too. And, and I haven't really talked that much about meat yet, but I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> but uh, uh, I want to make sure that, you know, this is a channel we're talking about being cautious, being prepared, not in fear, just to get the last, look at it this way. Being self-reliant allows you to get the last laugh. Someone says, ha, your power's out. And you go, ha, no biggie. Uh, ha, you can't get this at the grocery store. We're out. You can't, won't be here for months. You go, okay, <laughs> no biggie. I've got more at home. Um, you know, it, I, I kind of like it looking at it that way in a positive way. Self-reliance is allowing you to still function, not be uh, uh, panicking. And uh, all it takes is a little bit of visionary thought of what could happen from the lightest to the heaviest and how prepared do you want to be and how how fast can you do it um, based on your uh, uh, location, based on your income, those kind of things. No matter what your income is, even if you're on welfare, you could still prep a little and, and do things to be more self-reliant. Um, so, uh, and, and you can do it at any age. Uh, I, I revealed my age. Uh, I'm no spring chicken. And so, uh, uh, and younger people can do a lot more things than I, I can uh, physically. And so, yeah, there's uh, tons of things you could do. There's, you know, if, if the power went out, how would you handle your heat? How would you handle your water? Which I was asked earlier, how do I handle my water? Um, and uh, just because I have a backup system for generating stuff, I still store bottled water. Not a, as much as I used to now that I know I have my generator uh, and I have a well. But, uh, you know, self-reliance is a peace of mind. And I call it the last laugh. When something goes amok and everybody's holding their heads and panicking and they can't get any stuff, um, just like, I can't get gas from my generator. Or why didn't you buy gas earlier? Um, things like that, you know, just, huh, I've got 80 gallons. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's self, self reliance is easy. Re it's uh, accountability for yourself and your family. And uh, you can do it quickly or you can do it at your own speed. And, uh, and it's not a gloom and doom thing. It's just having a chance to get that, take care of the what ifs that could happen in your region. And it's different everywhere. Here in the Northwest, I'm in Oregon. Uh, we worry about the Cascadia. We worry about, we have a couple of volcanoes that could go off here. Um, you know, we could have a couple of weird things. Fires, big here. Um, we pray that it doesn't happen here, but, you know, we have a lot of things. Carrie, you see what you're right here. Seems like everyone has already forgot about the all the meat and br um, bread being sold out at the stores last year. Oh, yeah, I know. Everybody shows short. This is a short memory. It's like, we just had a terrible thing happen overseas. And then it seems like the media was trying to get our attention on the Ida thing, but we need to stay focused over there because we have Americans, um, not just military, that are over there that need our help, and, and it's going to get real sad over there. But, uh, uh, yeah, everybody has these short-term memories, and we can't let that happen. And uh, don't let – and we're hearing it from – I'm just repeating things I'm already hearing, but don't let the media – Dictate your thoughts um, and then be careful how much media you watch, but get a variety in, in media. Um, yes, I'll occasionally I try to avoid the prime stuff because they're you can so obvious what their intent is and what they're backing. Um, so make sure you do listen to alternative news too, which you can get on YouTube, uh, Blaze TV, there's a right side, there's uh, tons of other ones, I can't remember all of them. And, um, and if you have a little faith, too, some of the faith channels will also do the news and how it applies to your faith, too, and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's up to us not to forget. And so, um, and when you hear these people talk, I, to the biggest shocker last year when Texas had their freeze and somebody got on there and uh, she says, how do you heat water? You know, because it, and it's like that. To me, was the dumbest question I've ever heard. How do you heat water? Well, do you have a little pro propane stove or a little butane stove? 
Could you build a little rocket stove in your backyard? Do you have a Coleman stove you could take out in the backyard or a porch? I mean, that's a ridiculous question is if you, you better learn how to heat water. <laughs> so make that your first self-reliant thing. How do I heat water if I don't have electricity? Number one, because you, you can heat water, then a lot of these freeze-dried foods and stuff like that, if you bought a, a um, one of those buckets or two, you'd be high in a hog. You'd be filling your belly, and uh, uh, all you have to do is heat water. It's not hard. So come on, people. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead of my list here, but I'm going to talk about meat a little bit. So when you buy a homestead and stuff like that, not all homestead areas have ordinances that allow you to have like cattle or like pigs. Uh, but here I can have horses, I can have sheep and um, goats, things like that, but I don't want them. And I don't need to because I'm surrounded by all kinds of farms here. And so down here we have a place called the Sisters Cattle Company. If I need a half, a quarter of a beef, a half a beef, a whole beef, I can order it online and, and they'll ship it to me um, or I can go pick it up. So let them do the work. Let them take care of the animals. Let, and it's all grass fed stuff. And uh, the processing, all that stuff's pro taken care of. Because a single cow alone, if you were to process it, you're talking thousands of dollars to, um, for, for that process. And I'd rather focus on poultry. So I can, my meats handle, I do it actually very simply through a, um, a butcher box. And I also have another company, I can't remember the name of it, uh, where I actually have regular uh, uh, beef sent to me um, and actually do some pork chops that way. And uh, I just bring it in as, as we need it and actually more than I need. So I'm building up my freezers with beef uh, in a slow process without the big shock. Cause I did buy a quarter beef, uh, last year. And that was, I had to drop four or $500 to do that. Um, anyway, uh, but, uh, not everybody can do that. So do it slowly and, and just order a little extra each time. So you store up in your freezer and then make sure you can, uh, if you buy chest feet freezers, and your power goes out, you put a generator on it. You don't have to leave the generator on it the whole time. You get everything up to freezing. And because chest freezers keep all the cold air low, you can let it sit for quite a few hours before you have to turn it back on. And it'll save money, you know, save time, um, save you from burning up fuel in your generator. So uh, to me, little chest freezers are amazing. Uh, so meat wise, that's how we get our beef. And then also if I'm in Costco, but lately Costco's is getting as high as 14 to $16 per pound for beef now, uh, which I'm, you know, the ones I'm buying online from ButcherBox and the other company are very competitive and I'm getting a better quality meat. So our discussion here is going to be for next year is maybe growing meat birds, which is amazing Cornish cross. I can raise over four to 500 pounds of meat in less than eight to eight to nine weeks. Comprehend that. Um, so the uh, cr Cornish crossbreed chickens are amazing. Uh, they, they're designed to grow really fast. In fact, they grow so fast, sometimes they have problems walking the whole works. Um, and then all, so what I need to build is new chicken hutches for them and a processing station outdoors to process the chickens. And I need probably another freezer to handle all that chicken. But I'm thinking 25 to 50 birds next year. And also maybe a four to six turkeys next year, uh, which I have no, you know, no problem on our ordinances here to have those kind of animals. Um, and I've raised chickens before and I used to have a game bird farm. I've used to deal with birds a lot. And so I've just kind of been sitting back, seeing how bad things are getting. I'm kind of letting the environment tell me maybe I, I kind of held off. On, I, I took on a lot this year, so I didn't get into the meat birds. And I've been thinking about it, and I'm still thinking about it. And if things aren't too crazy, um, I kind of doubt that. It's getting crazy already. I may actually start doing the meat birds, which 
you know, if you're watching our channel, you'll see exactly how we do it. Uh, uh, but basically, we'll build a special pins for them, a special station outdoors that's covered that has a cleaning station and a place where we can heat up water, a cleaning table, or have water out there, and we'll have a uh, uh, automated plucking uh, device to uh, clean the birds. And so, and then we will have a setup for hanging the birds, vacuum sealing them, and uh, basically put, putting the information on the outside of the bag when they're processed, how much they weigh, and put them in the freezer. And uh, I mean, it's just in one day's time and butchering day, you could fill an entire freezer. And the price to do it is amazing. In fact, sometimes you could beat the prices, not of like the store kind of chicken you buy that's processed in these crazy chicken houses and stuff. But if you were to buy um, uh, chicken from regular mini farms and stuff like that, you could be paying up to $6 a pound and stuff. And you'll easily beat that price if you do it yourself. So that's in the... If you watch our channel, you kind of see how we brainstorm or what we're going to do for next summer. Um, but right now we're kind of just getting through this summer and we're going to have to, we're changing some of our systems. Um, one of our NFTs, we're going to switch over to Dutch bucket system and things like that. So we've got our hands full going into that. But if we decide to do that, we'll start building those facilities in the early spring or late winter. So we're prepared to, bring in birds and, and, and raise them when the summer comes. That's a lot to talk about. So uh, I actually have only three minutes left, believe it or not, people. And uh, I want, first of all, thank everybody who's been watching the show. I know mostly the people that we'll see on this show will be after the fact because we don't normally do live chats. I'm going to try to do them weekly and get in the process of doing it. It's kind of a thing we just got to get in the routine of doing it. And, and as we get more people, allow us more time to uh, uh, work with other people. <laughs> Am I going to have hired help? <laughs> Gosh, I wish I could. Um, uh, I'd love to have an intern, somebody that's like the, wants to learn locally. Uh, it'd be great to be a young teenager who wants to learn something new. But uh, that would come here, we teach them. We send them home with food and things like that. But an intern that I can't, I may try to donate to them and stuff like that. But it would be more of a trade, knowledge, produce, and uh, uh, for, you know, putting a few hours on the homestead with us to help us out. Because it is, uh, you'd be amazed how much work we have to do on this property. And I have to do that. And uh, sure, he works. And I can't expect her to come out here and help process uh food and stuff and she already helps with the canning and all that stuff and she's got and she likes to mow the lawns so we're actually at our peak so we got to be careful not to overload ourselves but that's a great question i would love to have an intern i'd love to pass knowledge on um and uh someday maybe i have a family member that's kind of hurting i could let them live in my fifth will in return they could help us on a homestead or something you know that's just thinking out loud but Anyway, uh, I am running out of time. I didn't even get through my whole list here. Uh, I do want to um, say thank you very much for all, all the folks that caught us today. Um, uh, if you catch this show afterwards, uh, please feel free to leave comments and uh, let us know uh, uh, things you'd like us to talk about. If you like the show and the format, uh, I'm sure the format's going to change as we get more people involved uh, in the chat and stuff like that. So, that's my responsibility to try to get more chats out, get people used to coming to visit. Hopefully they enjoy themselves. Um, Carrie, you had some great questions. Blue collar worker. Thank you for the compliments. And uh, so uh, Carrie also says, I wish I was close. <laughs> I could help out. I'd love to have you too. <laughs> uh, God bless you and your family. Thank you so much. And you too. Um, and guys, before I forget, don't forget to uh, like, subscribe and share. Sharing our video is really what could really help us. Um, we're, you know, we got a pretty good, uh, we're just over 7,000 followers and stuff uh, on the YouTube. We have followers and other stuff too. And uh, um, an Oregon farm girl, you're just outside of Bend. <laughs> I didn't know you were here. <laughs> so uh, 
I'm just closing up, but uh, if you watch the show over again, you'll see all the things we talked about. And we were talking about interns and things like that, too. So uh, anyway, uh, gosh, I wish I would have had you on earlier. But uh, uh, we'll be doing this again. And uh, uh, you might also in the comments let me know what the better time is for most people to catch a show like this when it's live. Uh, but please feel free to leave comments after the show's over. This will also be put in the Ranger Rob podcast. And uh, yeah, so guys, thank you very much. I got to wrap it up. I got my hours up and I want to thank everybody. And so uh, uh, I got to also find my little ending here. Uh, one moment, please. Um, I didn't get, there it is. So anyway, guys, thank you. And we'll catch up with you again. And please feel free to leave comments and we will respond. So thanks again, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much for watching our video. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. Thanks.